Eric, glad to be with you today. Glad to meet you as well. Mm -hmm. So we're getting ready to jump into the case portion of our interview. You ready to go? The best I can be. Awesome. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about the background and our client. So today we're looking at our client is a major consumer electronics retailer. They sell AV equipment, computers, content, mostly CDs and DVDs, and software. The store has been seeing increased competition from brick and mortar stores like Walmart, as well as online retailers like Dell and Amazon. So they've come to us with a few key questions. They really wanna understand how the industry is evolving, what the winning retail model is, and what they should do. Excellent. Let me just make sure I have everything that you mentioned there. Uh, our client is a consumer electronics store, and mm -hmm. you say it's brick and mortar, correct? They correct. sell things like computers, CDs, DVDs, you know, software, I'm guessing games and other, you know, cameras and such. Uh, they've seen increased competition from sort of big box retailers as well as e-commerce. Was there any other channels that you mentioned that I didn't kind of categorize there as far as competition they're seeing? Other brick nope. and mortar, perhaps? No. Nope. Okay. Yeah, brick, brick and mortar and e-commerce are the two I mentioned. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, and you say the industry is evolving. I think the world, just as far as technology, is evolving. So they would seem to be hit first <laughs> if we're a little worried about that. Now, with this uh, sort of evolving industry, they would like us to come in there and understand what they can do to compete against these areas where they're seeing increased competition, as well as being able to find new growth outlets. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, you know what, Eric, at this stage, they really just have come to us with pretty open arms saying, we want you to tell us what to do. We want to understand better how that industry is evolving. We want to understand what the winning retail model is. So yeah, we're going to get to define a lot of that. Okay, excellent. I think I may have just a few questions for you before we move forward with this. Uh, geographically, where are they located? Are we talking about mainly in the United States? Are they a global company, uh, specific industry, I mean, specific locations regionally or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Let's consider them a pretty uh, diversely spread across the lower 48 in the US. Okay, so they're mainly in the US. And as far as a change that they're looking to see that they came to us for, are we looking for, you know, increased market share? Are we looking for increasing revenues? Is there a specific target that they want to focus on more? Or is this pretty much hitting the entire business model? And there's a lot so much to look for that they don't need to really focus on one or the other. They need to focus on everything. They've, they've seen decreasing market share. They've seen decreasing revenues. And they've come to us really wanting to look at everything at this stage. Okay, perfect. Well, give me a two minute break here and I will sort of build out a framework and see if we can't drive this case to something that makes our client happy. Okay, great. Thank you.
Brilliant. So I think the question really comes down to how does a brick and mortar compete against, you know, sort of those big box stores with their economies of scales and the e-commerce giants who just, you know, have a lower rent, you know, right off the bat than the retail stores. So I'd like to look at break this down into sort of three categories, uh, the competition itself, the market and really a strategy going forward. Uh, the competition, I want to know where we're competing exactly. You know, are we competing on price? Are we competing on service? Why do our customers choose them over us? You know, how can we differentiate ourselves? I think is the essential solution we would try to get out of that bucket. As far as the market, I want to see sort of how the market share looks and how it's changed over time. Uh, how do customers, you know, purchase things? How do they make decisions? You know, what sort of customer data can we pull out that might show us a better place or a better position for us to be in? And then as far as strategy, again, really looking at customer needs, customer wants, you know, how do we get them the best product? Are we doing, you know, more sales? Are we doing a better branding sort of campaign? Are we looking at new channels? Do we need to start competing in like e-commerce or, you know, direct to client? And then is our supply chain really able to handle something that competes with these people? You know, it seems like we have to get our, they have to get their products to the customers quicker. So how do we do that? So that I left that as part of the strategy. I think, you know, again, looking at, you know, sort of the competition and how we compete would be a good place to start. Okay. What are some of the other areas you think are going to be most important? As far as competition? No, just in general, among the things that you listed. What, are, what would be your top three? I would say the customers are price sensitive. I think that would be top the top one. I think uh, definitely quality, you know, People are looking for the best product, especially when it's, you know, computer stuff, they're looking for the newest product. So making sure the store has the newest items, the newest technology and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Eric, you know, when we look at this space and you think about retail, uh, brick and mortar retail, which they're currently in, what do you think makes for a successful retail model? Customer service, I think, would be definitely at the top of the list there. Customers come in, they want to talk to somebody and speak to somebody. They don't want to just read the specs online. They want to touch, feel, try out the products and, you know, really be able to make a, an informed decision rather than just, you know, kind of a picture on a TV screen or just looking at a box. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What else? Uh, they'd want to be able to, I think, know that the, the product works. I think especially with electronics, we're seeing, you know, a lot of breaking down, a lot of warranty issues. So I think they'd like to be able to service their electronic items as well as know that there's a warranty protecting them going forward. I think that really scares clients. Hey, what if I buy this and it breaks 91 days after I bought it? Am I out of warranty or mm -hmm. can we extend that a little bit? Absolutely. Yeah, I like that. What else? I think there is, you know, sort of that big brand that they enjoy. We see, you know, basically three or four computer companies really dominating right now you have your apple your hp and your dell so they're want to gonna they're gonna want to see the popular brands they're gonna want to see you know the cds that they you know request so they want to see an assortment but as well as quality as far as brand name mm -hmm. and how how do you think our from what you know, the limited amount you know, how well do you think our clients doing in that category right now? I would think that 
part of their issue would be their inventory that they have to carry just so customers are attracted to the area. I think that the customers come in, they probably play around with it a little bit and, you know, don't really make the decisions right there on the spot, you know, especially for large purchases, smaller ones like DVDs and CDs. Those are probably more impulsive buys, but when it comes to larger, you know, I'm guessing you, just thinking of electronic stores, you can go all the way up to washers and dryers. These are things that you and the wife talk about before you purchase. So there's a chance that this client might be losing customers. And once they come in, try it out, go home, find a cheaper price or, you know, something similar to it and buy it there. So I think that's where they're losing the customers. And I think that the client is also sitting on a lot of inventory within these stores that perhaps isn't turning over as quick as they would like it to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So successful retail model, customer service, service and warranty, product mix, anything else you'd put in there? I think installation. I think some mm -hmm. of these products, you know, stereo products, I'm thinking back to, you know, when I was a kid and my dad's first stereo, they came in and they installed it. But there might also be, you know, today we have cameras everywhere. Perhaps they come out and do a whole security unit where the cameras are watching the area. You know, you have all this. The Internet of Things is really changing everything. And I don't I can't even keep up with all this technology and how it integrates and you always need that IT person to kind of come in so that you have that set up. So it's not only warranty, but I think also installation, which you could probably separate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So which and that really these... falls into the service model that I think they're going for as a brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which of these might you want to look at? What would you want to know? I think we could look at the financials and see perhaps where the company is doing well. I know we mentioned at the beginning that they're uh, seeing increased competition. You know, I, I'm guessing the increased competition is really coming under the product listing. But I'd really like to look at sort of their service and warranty revenue a little separately from that and say, hey, what are the margins? Are they doing well there? If we're doing well there, then how do we increase our sales as far as the product itself? So making sure that that is sort of a long term revenue generation, because those payments come in upfront for work that you don't need to do until down the line. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a good you know, capital reserve for them on that. And then, you know, with the products, what, I'm guessing the margins aren't extremely large they're probably relatively you know low as far as compared to you know other software you know distribution industries like that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well we don't have any data on that but we have thought that maybe it would be impertinent you know, important to us to look more at the product mix category mm -hmm. so you know, if you were looking at product mix for this client, what things do you think would be important? What would you want to know? So for the product mix itself, I think I'm debating whether I want to split this into two or three categories, just because that warranty and that installation, those things are both very large. So I am going to split it into there because Again, warranty, it's almost like insurance. It's money set aside. It's not always used. So there's not always a cost associated that you could really say, hey, here's the cost of this warranty where, you know, you really have to round it off to what it does in a year. Um, installation, we could definitely narrow down, hey, what sort of installation revenue? How much is it costing us? And then as far as products, we could, you know, break that down even farther into computers. We could break it down into CDs. We could categorize it music, you know, technology, uh, appliances and that sort of way as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, these are great thoughts. Yeah. And, and as we started to look at it, um, you know, you, you listed out some areas that 
are true of successful competitors in the marketplace today. However, our client isn't doing a lot of that yet. When okay. we start to look at their breakdown of the product mix and their inventory, we're seeing that um, they have uh, they have quite a few CDs and DVDs, and this is a space that's been quite big for them even still today. Uh, however, of course, we know more and more that consumers are buying content directly. Of, you can buy songs directly over the internet. You can buy, you know, movies. There's so many different places now to do that. Uh, video on demand, etc. So just given this and this one small segment, what implications do you think this has for the client who historically has sold not only many CDs and DVDs, but the accessories that go along with them as well? That's very interesting. You mentioned CDs and DVDs because this was in the back of my mind who are those people that buy CDs and DVDs? I guess, you know, if you have an old car that still has a CD player, you'd go and purchase that. Perhaps you liked a movie so much that you need to have it around. But yes, with streaming, with the, you know, in, invention of sort of the Netflix and, you know, these other direct-to-consumer products, it becomes very difficult to justify the space that this retailer might allocate to this area. You're always going to see some sales, but we've got to make sure that the square footage is going to be, you know, purposeful. It's not what it used to be. It's not the eight 1980s where people came in, you know, once a week on Tuesday because that was new release day. It's just, you know, people are wandering. It's an impulsive buy. So mm -hmm. really understanding the market for CDs and DVDs and what that size is per sales. And I think that would help us narrow down the square footage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they're going to be able to continue to be successful with this model? With selling DVDs and CDs? Mm -hmm. I was in a Best Buy the other day and I still saw some. So it's very limited to, you know, two or three aisles. Uh, I think that video games actually has a larger, you know, space wise than CDs or DVDs, but I don't really see it beneficial in the long run. I think I, I've seen so many charts about how the music industry has ever so evolved from LPs to the cassettes, you know, a track, if you were around back then to CDs and now streaming is I'm going to, you know, make an assumption that it's at least 75% of the market these days. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You mentioned opening up floor space by removing this part of the product line. What would you replace it with? For product space, I would look at the more popular items, I think. You know, I, I think looking at revenue streams is one way to do it. I think looking at, you know, sort of what the customer preferences are lately, uh, being somebody that has gone there several times, things that I would go to a electronic store for would be computer accessories, the computer themselves. Hey, I, I left my charger here. I'm going to need my charger while I'm out on the road. My cord broke. I think those sort of accessory items become very valuable in the long run because they're small, they're cheap, but they're so necessary that I think the turnover, it's not like you buy a computer and buy one cord over a year, you're probably going to buy two or three cords, same with the phone charger. But I think also looking at another sort of, of that product mix would be new technologies that are more convenient and more easily accessible. and you've seen the price come down. Specifically, I want to say, you know, sort of those surveillance cameras, the audio as far as, you know, lights, not only being lights but and more efficient, but also being speakers, which I think is very interesting. And also being able to change colors. I think that's very interesting to people. And the easily they are to sync with other products, I think that makes them very valuable to the clients. So when you have those four or five major, you know, uh, uh, suppliers that you're buying from, if these smaller products that I've been mentioning can link with all of those, that really becomes your business model. Hey, how do we depend on these people to bring people in for not only, you know, the smaller things, but hey, here are the accessories that go with them. Now everything works together. Now somebody's not worrying about, hey, is this going to be out of date 
in six months, are they going to make a product because I like Apple and I want to buy their stuff? So do I wait for them? So, you know, I think that integration is very important in this retail space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. So, um, you know, one thing that, that the team ended up doing, seeing this, you know, our client seems to be living in the past a little bit, a lot of <laughs> CDs, a lot of DVDs. Uh, we did some analysis and it, it turns out that they would need to double the revenue of their other products in order to counteract these trends. So, and then we, we've learned that for this business, fixed costs don't grow in proportion to sales. They increase on a 75% scale curve. So even when we're doubling sales, fixed costs are only going to be 75% of what they would have been on a percent of revenue basis. We also know that our gross margin is 25%. And right now our net income is zero. But what would our net income be if we doubled revenue? So our gross margin is 25%, our sales, our cost of, so you, when you say sales, that's cost of goods sold? I'm sorry, um, I missed that. Oh, I was just mentioning that the, the, the way that our fixed costs trend upwards, so it's it's, it's not one-to-one -one in terms of revenue. They oh, are so there's costs. a decreasing, because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's spread over that. Okay, and our gross margins are 25%. Mm -hmm. So if net income, if we were to double net income, what would that be as a percentage? Is that the question you're asking? Yep. Uh, we just sort of visualize this. Sorry, when people read numbers, I like to think of them visually. Mm -hmm. uh, so net income would have to double and I think I'm having a little trouble understanding yeah, your you, exact question. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You certainly don't have enough information yet to answer yeah. the question. <laughs> okay. um, so, you know, given, given the limited amount that you know, what are some of the things that you'd like to, like to better understand or what, what's the data you think you would need? I would definitely need some total revenue. Um, I would need, you know, I think gross margins helps us understand the cost of goods sold, but I think um, sort of inventory turnover might be interesting. But yeah, I think looking at an income statement might help us really understand what we need to do as far as projected out uh, sort of financial numbers that they're looking to get with the two times the revenue, doubling their revenue. Yep. So let's say that starting out, revenue is a hundred million. So that's one piece. Then if you're going to look at a balance sheet or an income statement, what else, what else would you be looking for? So if we're looking at revenue, uh, I would need to know the, we have our gross margins of 20%. I would need to know cost of goods sold. <clears throat> Let me go ahead and boil that down to mm -hmm. our, our operating profit. So okay. in, including a bunch of things there, then our operate, operating profit is 25 million in that same year. What else would you need to know? So we have net income, I would need to know what sort of, we have revenue, operating profits, cost of goods sold. Do we have any information on, on our net margins? We don't. We don't. No, just that gross margin percentage. Just that gross margin percentage. 25%. Um, 
Is there any information as far as we, you said no information as far as costs? We just have our operating profit. We have our revenue. No, we do. We do. We don't. I don't have cost of goods sold, but I do actually have for okay. you a fixed cost number. So okay. in year one, uh, same year, the, that the fixed costs are twenty five million. So given that, if we were to double revenues in a year, what would our net income percentage be? Okay, let's say, so if 100 million, we're looking at 200 million to double. Mm -hmm. We're saying that fixed cost for the original 100 million is 25 million. And then for the additional 200, it would be an additional 75% of that so that becomes 25. Just a little less than 20 million. Um, let's just call it 20 million to be safe. So Eric, that actually, gets... let me have you apply that scale to what the total fixed cost would have been in the second year. So apply that scale to a doubled fixed cost of 25. Okay, so we just wanna say 20, so 50 million. So we're subtracting 50 million for fixed cost. Yeah, but but that fixed costs don't scale one-to-one, -one, they'll just scale 75%. And that's what I was doing. So I thought that, you know, based on 100 million, so we have 100 million, that's 100%. And then if we did that extra 100 million at 75% of that, that would be 20 million for that additional 100 million that we've doubled. Does that but, make sense as far as my numbers? <laughs> uh, it, it's just, it gets us a little bit different because what I want you to do is just take 75% of that 50 million. That would be the easier route, wouldn't it? <laughs> Uh, so 75% of 50 million gives us 40 million, roughly. Roughly. Let's see, roughly, let's see. We'll break it down a little bit farther. Um, so. So we're subtracting 12 and a half from that. That gives us 37.5 million in fixed cost. Yep. And as far as, excuse me, heater right on me right now. And now I really feel like I'm in the hot seat. <laughs> uh, now we're looking at our gross margins which is 25%, he said. Mm -hmm. So our gross margins of 25% give us 50 million in gross margins. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that would leave out Feel like we have some numbers missing. Mm -hmm. Like what? Uh, we're definitely missing some costs because our operating profit is not going to increase with scale and take over. You know, one hundred and twenty something percent. So there's additional costs. I'm guessing SG&A costs or something similar to that. Marketing costs. You're correct, yeah. There would be other costs associated here. For simplicity for now, we're gonna go ahead and disregard the other costs. Okay. So between gross margins, we understand that at 50 million, fixed costs at 50 million, or 37.5 million, that leaves us with a remainder of roughly 12.112.5. Right. So I just don't see that as being our operating profit right off the bat. I feel like we can scale well, it, it that was down. Just, 
Yeah, it was just 50 minus 37.5, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 12.5? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if that if, if we're simplifying it all down and that 12.5 is our net income, then mm -hmm. what is that as a percentage of our revenue? Uh, 6.2%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you think about that? It seems a little low. It seems like we would need to do a little bit more understanding is that helping us double you know i know we've doubled our revenue but is that you know acceptable you know, we'd have to look at products mix i believe i think especially the products themselves this seems very normal 6.2 percent it's the additional services that we talked about in the warranties that i don't know if they're doing that already so i think that's where my brain is going it's like what's the percentage on that that seems like that should bump that number up aggressively you know with an additional 100 million in revenue mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah good call good call and this was just projecting out an increase in revenue for the tangible products sold on the floor. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, Eric, given what we've looked at today so far, um, at this point in time, what would be your recommendation for the client? Uh, can you give me just a second to write some things down? I just want to make sure I'm organized. Sure. Excellent. Well, first, thank you for allowing us to take a look at the company. And we think we've come up with some pretty good ideas to help you move forward and uh, keep your business alive. Uh, a recommendation really is to differentiate yourself from kind of that old thought of <clears throat> what a brick and mortar was into what it should be. Uh, our recommendation is first to really look at your product mix how you've allocated your floor space. You know, things like DVDs and DVDs aren't as relevant and probably don't uh, account for much of sale, as much of sales as they used to. So really looking at the product mix and seeing what the square footage on your store should be allocated as would be the first step. Uh, looking into a differentiated product mix as far as warranties and installation, really creating services and differentiating yourself as not a product seller, but a service maintainer within the electronic, you know, community there. Um, I think some risk and the reason we're recommending this is because of the risk is the lower prices that big box stores and e-commerce can provide to your clients. So coming in, making sure that those lower prices aren't the factor that you're competing against. You're competing in a service, people that prefer quality and that somebody's gonna actually help them out with this. I think, you know, with that lower price risk, there might be some way that you should look into price matching with them if it's if you're able to do that in certain categories at first and, you know, move forward uh, with that, I think is the next step you know, to evaluate where you can compete, where you can see margins smaller in that sort of price war that they've created, because you still do want to compete with that, but just in a different level. 
So again, thank you for your time. And I hope if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Great, thank you, Eric. All right, how do you feel like that went? It's got its ups and downs, right? <laughs> it's like riding a wave. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But, um, well, you know, let's go ahead and walk through chronologically, um, you know, and I'd say overall. Um, there were there were a few rougher moments, but overall, I really took away and appreciated how you stayed cool, calm, and collected, how you were confident in the way that you talked about things, how you um, presented your, uh, your, your communication style is filled with uh, connection and examples and analogies, and all of those are really good positive things, um, which I feel like that conversational nature um, is where a lot of people struggle to get to in the casing process, right? And I, and e either you've you've worked really hard at that, or that comes supernaturally. Either way, um, you know it it helps smooth over some of those rough spots, right? Uh, so upfront, you know, gave the intro, and you asked some good questions. You had great clarification. Uh, you know, you're asking about geography. You're asking about goals, and. I didn't have a lot to give you there, which left you a really open question to try and structure in the framework. Um, one very small knit stylistically, um, you know, you chose to, before you wrote the structure, you said, let me take a two minute pause and I will write out my framework. And to me, that was just too case interview-esque, right? It, I know that's exactly what you're going to do, and you were very clear with me on that, but I think that that's, that's one area stylistically where I would have preferred uh, if you would have left that more conversational as well. Can I just you take a moment? fall back on old habits when you're nervous, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just take a moment to structure my thoughts, right? Yeah. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm just going to take a second here and make a plan for the client or, you know, some, some other sort of thing that you would, have, that you would say in the real world. Um, uh, then you took, you know, right over two minutes to write your structure. You took just under two minutes to be able to communicate the structure. I think that that was all good. Um, so what, um, what I felt in your structure, uh, I, there was, there was a, a missing piece around our company, I think, and the, you know, wanting to better understand our operations, our financials, our product mix. And that easily came into the conversation later on and you came up with some great ideas in that area. Uh, but overall, that would certainly need to be a part of the equation. And then when you got into your last couple of buckets, um, you had, a, I, I believe, a market bucket and a strategy bucket. Uh, but And both of those ended up having customer stuff in it. And it just left me kind of thinking and wishing that that was a little bit more messy, um, either pulling all the customer stuff out, if there still would have been enough there in the market bucket and the strategy bucket, um, or at least only talking about customers in one of those buckets. Um, then we went into a couple of different creative questions, right? And we looked at, uh, we looked at their product mix. We talked about CDs and DVDs. And the, in the upfront prompt, all that I gave you was they sell AV equipment, computers, CDs, DVDs, and software. And I understand your mind went to what you know, successful players in the space are doing now, but I actually hadn't given you any context or clues that they were doing anything like a warranty or service program or selling larger appliances like washers and dryers or you know, this actually, the prompt, it was a very limited product mix. And so, and then, it, and then it turns out as we started to look at it, even just initially, you say, oh gosh, a huge part of their sales and floor space is CDs and DVDs. That's a problem, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you had some good ideas there around, um, you know, that that, that um, wasn't going to be successful moving forward. 
Uh, and you had some good ideas, particularly around, you know, you talked about a lot of different smart home components, right? Which are becoming more and more popular today that could potentially replace that space. I thought you had a really good insight that I wish you would have drawn out a little bit further, which actually was your, I think one of the first things to come out of your mouth was to say, oh, I'm just curious, who would these consumers be in today's day and age who are coming in and buying CDs and DVDs? And so in that same train of thought, as we think about, okay, are those same consumers still going to be willing to come to our store? Are those consumers of today the same as the consumers of tomorrow? Are we going to have to change our, the way we think about our, our customers and thinking about our customer segmentation? When we're thinking about replacing that floor space and, and including you know, more technologically advanced things like smart home, uh, products and accessories, is that still going to play to our current customer base? You know, I'm not sure, right? That would be a key thing that I would want to look into further, right? So I think I thought that you had a great initial insight there about the type of customer we might be attracting today. And then just that extra piece there about that being in the, the longer equation and thinking about how um, us progressing as a company, how that's going to affect uh, you know, our current customer mix as well. Uh, we talked about the, you know, what makes a successful retail model and you had some, you know, I, I kept pushing you, right? Your customer service, service and warranty, product mix. The fourth one ended up kind of also being in the service and warranty space, which is okay, right? But uh, the big, the big one missing, you know, we're talking about brick and mortar retail, right? So a successful, a successful retail model. And I gave the question very openly, but um, something there about uh, profitability in today's day and age, right? Or about the, you know, the high, the high fixed costs and kind of high operating costs of a brick and mortar structure, how retail today is now not only competing with other brick and mortar, uh, but also e-commerce, thinking about how that's diversified the competition and the overall market landscape. Um, but getting into that area in some way, shape or form, I think that could have sounded like a lot of different things um, about having, you know, establishing that competitive advantage or, and having a profitable model. Uh, but that's the one piece there, you know, in that uh, creative question that um, I wish you would have gotten to. And then, um, you know, we got we got to the math and I had a very boiled down set of information for you. Right. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that what could have made it a little bit smoother would be to communicate out even more clearly, even just the, the basics, the basic formulas, right? It's like, okay, you've given me net, uh, the, the current net income is 0% and we're looking for the new net income percentage. I know net income a key indicator of profitability. So we're thinking about profit. Of course, that's revenue minus costs. So, you know, what do we know right now about revenues? What do we know right now about costs? And I, even though I was being rather withholding with data and information, I think that that very simple framing would have allowed us to boil down to, okay, I have one revenue number for you. I actually only have one cost number for you. And so then you can take those and you, you went into, you know, some good insights and some good detail. Well, I would want to know this and I'd want to know this. I'd want to look at the balance, you know, sheet for this. And uh, this certainly can't encompass all the costs and, and it didn't um, and it wasn't trying to, but I think that just being able to get the metrics that you needed to make the, the calculation asked of you uh, talking through the, the, the simplified formula, what you know of it, uh, could help you, you know, put some put some hooks in the water for your interviewer to to give you some of that information. Um, so that was my one thought for you there. And then, but then you you stayed, I thought, very calm through that, um, at, at least uh, my perception of you. And then, you know, kind of use that as our pivot point, asked you to wrap it up, um, give a recommendation. And you took about a minute to put that together, which was completely fine. And you came back with a structured set of ideas uh, and thoughts. My one comment for you on that was you used the phrase 
at least in the first two buckets, um, you know, looking at, I, I, I would want, I would want you to be looking at such and such. Um, however, I think that you could pivot even further and be, a, be more assertive and direct in your recommendation here at the end of the case. So in the CD DVD space, I think you should move away from CDs and DVDs, you know, in the uh, drive, you know, kind of driving to action. What was your second bucket? There was a similar one. Warranty and installation. Ah, I think that you should move to include warranty and installation, right? I mean, that would just mm -hmm. be, that would just be the action oriented, assertive recommendation. Uh, and you, you know, you, you, you made it a little conditional and you made it a little qualified, but I, I want you to put that stake in the ground and just be assertive with your recommendations at that point. With that being said, and I look across all of it, right? Um, I think that if, you know, if I were scoring you for a first round and I, I was going into the room, I would say, you know, this guy's got a lot of potential and, and it wasn't great, but I think, I think he did well. Like, how did the other case go? Because if they both went, you know, well, then let's push him through. If the other one was any rougher than this, then it would be like, oh, maybe next time. Let's keep them in our, you know, let's keep them on our list or something like that. But, um, you know, that that's my that's my take and my feedback. Any questions there? I no, I think your insight was great. I think because. I have a little bit of a background with bookkeeping and stuff, and I, I also have a background in art, and I think conceptually, and I like to touch things and talk mm. about them very passionately, which you complimented me on. I've noticed that, you know, going into these sort of the analytical part, you know, I need that, you know, that information in front of my hand. If I don't have it, I need to grab more information. So it's when it's very, you know, sort of, like, hey, here's a little bit, here's a little bit. <laughs> it becomes it becomes frustrating almost. I guess it doesn't show, thank God, it doesn't show. But, you, you know, I know what's supposed to be there. And I'm like, okay, what am I looking for? Usually I'm just saying, hey, this, this, and this. So I thank you for that recommendation to kind of go back and, you know, understand how everything flows together a lot better. And I think once that's second nature, I think I'll do a lot better. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Nope, I think I think you have a lot of the intrinsics to do well in this type of case interview setting. And, you know, you never know what industry you're going to be hit with or what problem is going to come your way. But um, no, I can I can see the, the amount of the level and practice that you've done. So it was great to case with you today. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it very much. Mm -hmm.